So, Liam, you've, you've told us in your speech today a bit about the scale of monetary expansion here in the UK and indeed in the USA. Can you spell out for us how big that expansion has been and why it causes you concern? Well, you've seen um, monetary expansion between um, a third and a, a tripling and a quadrupling uh, really since the crash. Um, and I think you've got all sorts of uh, problems that, you rela that relate to that and, and our constant supply of cheap credit. First of all, it distorts economic behaviour. Uh, you can't have an economy that's entirely geared towards borrowers all the time and not savers. If we actually ex expect people to save, um, then they have to get a return on that saving. And part of the problem is that because there's such a low return with such low interest rates that those who would normally be financially prudent are, are looking at retail bonds, are looking at buy to let, and you're seeing a, a broader distortion in the economy. So w we need to ensure that, that that comes back. And then you have a number of, of related problems that uh, this cheap supply of credit means people can borrow, invest in something more adventurous. And one of the uh, elements of that that some commentators are focusing on now is the fact that it's possible to take that money, invest it overseas, and not only does the capital go overseas, but some of the skills go overseas too, and that may in the longer term uh, create competition that undermines uh, our own longer term prosperity. So there are so many risks uh, associated with what's happening at the present time. And, and what does that tell us, and what's your prescription, your recommendation for perhaps how central banks should operate differently in future, a different framework, different protocols, a different approach, different mandate? Uh, what can we learn from having gone into this problem? Do we need to kind of reboot the way we look at central banks? Well, we need to look at whether the relationship between central banks and central government has become too cosy and whether the central banks, rather than being the uh, lender of last resort to the private banking sector, has become the lender of first resort to government, and whether they're giving uh, undue consideration to uh, keeping the cost of borrowing low for their political masters who are massively overspending. So we do, I think, need to, to look at that. We need to look at the relationship. We need to look at some countries where they don't have central banks, whether they need to uh, look at uh, a slightly looser relationship. And we also have to look at the targets that we give in the UK to the Bank of England, for example. I would maintain that a 2% inflation rate target in the current environment, current global financial environment, is, is, is completely inappropriate. It was set in 1997 at a time when uh, this was 10 years before the, the, the big crash and uh, conditions are completely different. And if you take those 1997 conditions and apply them to today, what you're saying to the bank is you must make monetary policy decisions on the basis of a constant expansion of credit until you get to 2% inflation. And who knows where that would take us if you, contribute, uh, if you continue on that trajectory. Turning to fiscal policy now, uh, of, of course, uh, <coughs> under the coalition government and now under the conservative majority government, uh, George Osborne is edging the deficit down, sort of got halfway there in, in percentage terms. Um, but I, I think you, you and I both fear that, that, that there's a sort of feeling that once we've got back to zero, we can, it's party time again, or we can, we can turn on the taps of government spending. Um, what, what's your sense of whether the, the political mood in the House of Commons and in the country is that this is a short-term surgery, or is this permanent rehabilitation that is required on, our, on, on the fiscal side and on the balance sheet? Well, my message today was that we must understand that what we are undertaking in terms of fiscal consolidation is not a cyclical correction. It's a structural correction. And we have to accept that we have now passed for all time the high water mark of spending as a proportion of our national income. Uh, we need to return to what the Chancellor once described as sharing the proceeds of growth with a twist. He previously described that as uh, sharing the benefits of growth between increased public spending and deficit reduction. I think it should be between deficit reduction and taxation reduction so that we're actually seeing uh, a, a smaller state that enables the private sector to grow more effectively and create wealth. And I think that uh, in, in doing all of that, we need to understand that the deficit may be coming down, but it's still the third biggest in Europe. And every day that we run a deficit, our debt is going up. And every day that we have debt, we've got to pay debt interest. And we've reached a point, we're at about 50 billion pounds in debt interest this year. It is actually making the fiscal consolidation itself more difficult. And we better get ourselves out of that catch-22 quickly. And that is why we need to 
explain to the public that the days of high spending have gone because they leave behind a very, very difficult legacy, which we're dealing with now and we can deal with over time, and the current government's approach is exactly the correct one. But what we cannot afford in the era of globalisation is to make those same old stupid mistakes of spending much more than we're earning. And finally today, you shared with us some uh, interesting ideas on how we should actually measure real wealth creation in the economy, real economic growth. There's been debates really for years about whether GDP is a good measure and, and people point out that sort of terrible things can actually add to GDP, apparently improving the country that we're, we're living in, whereas actually they're not things that you'd wish on anybody. A car crash or something like that actually adds to GDP. You suggested that there should be a different measure of actually measuring how the real economy is doing. Can you tell us a little about that? Well, what I'm interested in is how we look at wealth creation and the long term prosperity that we enjoy. And what I was particularly interested in was um, the relationship between GDP and what I call GPP, gross private product. In other words, if you strip government spending out of our GDP, what are you left with? And how fast is GDP growing and how fast is GPP growing? And if you look at the uh, 23 years that the Conservatives have been in office since 1979, gross private product that I would describe as being more related to wealth creation, although not exactly the same, has grew faster than overall GDP. Uh, Labour, by contrast, tended to have a faster growth in GDP. In other words, they were achieving growth by spending more government money to stimulate economic activity. And if you spend money that you don't have today, someone has to repay it. And at the moment, that's us.